Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. It's your boy Definition, aka Death Vader, and it's time to go back to a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away for the penultimate episode of The Mandalorian. Throughout this video, we're just going to be breaking down everything that you need to know about the new release's overall plot, the Easter eggs that you may have missed, and our theories on what could be happening in the future. We're finally back to focusing on Baby Yoda, and this episode, titled The Reckoning, well, it certainly feels like that. Look, we'll get into it. Now, obviously, there will be heavy spoilers here, so if you haven't had a chance to watch episode 7 yet and don't want to know what happens, then I highly suggest that you turn off now. Make sure you subscribe to the channel for breakdowns like this every day and weekly coverage on The Mandalorian. I have spoken. With that out of the way, I just want to give a huge thank you for clicking this video. Now let's get into our breakdown of The Mandalorian. Okay, so episode 7, it pretty much picks up on the main plot thread that's been dangled throughout the entire season. That is, the battle between the Empire and Baby Yoda. Mando returns to Navarro, comes face to face with some old friends, and overall it makes for a great little entry that feels like it's got the series back on track after the side quests. The episode opens with Mando in space, traversing the galaxy when once more he gets a message from Grief Karga, who, since we last saw him in the Sin, has found his city under siege by Imperial forces. The client's numbers have grown exponentially, and Grief wants to return order. Grief also pays lip service to the fact that the bounty hunters won't stop coming for Baby Yoda if he doesn't stop them, and it's a plot element that we've been kind of predicting over the last couple of weeks, though I didn't expect it to take this long to get here. Grief wants to use Baby Yoda as bait to draw the client out, which will not only get the Empire off their back, but as a thank you, Grief will also forgive everything that happened in the third episode. Mando accepts the offer, and as predicted, he calls upon the network of contacts that he's been building throughout the season, making a stop at Sorgan to see Kara Dune. Unfortunately, he doesn't stop by to see Amira, but uh, I kind of have a feeling that if the show does ever wrap up, then Mando will retire to the planet to live out the rest of his life with the character. Who doesn't want a happy ending for him, right? Not, not that kind of happy ending. Anyway, Mando tells the ex-resistant shock trooper that the client is an Imperial warlord, and yep, as predicted with that too, it's one of the things that unites them together. I'll stop patting myself on the back for things I predicted now as well, because yeah, the, the plot was a bit obvious, it's not really Watchmen, so I'm not very special for getting this right. Anyway, I loved seeing her fist fighting for the fun of it in a bar, and she's probably my third favourite character in the show. The alien that she's going head to head with, it also looks like a Death Emirian, which is the same species as Darth Maul, and the fighter has similar horns and the facial marks that come with the race. Kara bests him easily and quickly joins forces with Mando. On the ship, Mando shows off his weapons to Kara, including thermal detonators, blasters and rifles. Here you can see the Rebel Alliance tattoo symbol on her face much better, and it makes her allegiances a lot more clearer, as last time it was barely visible. Mando again learns the hard way you can't leave Baby Yoda alone, and they decide to travel to Ovala 7, most notably Cool's Ranch, for some extra assistance. This kind of reminded me a bit of Obi-Wan dropping Luke off at the end of Revenge of the Sith, just from the way that some of the shots looked, and it's nice to remind ourselves that there's still good people out in the galaxy. They don't leave Baby Yoda with the character, but the moments are definitely similar. We also learn that Cool was a slave for the Empire that worked in gene farms and that he was sold to them as a servant and had to earn his freedom by working over three human lifetimes. Mando says Baby Yoda may be a strand cast, but Cool rebuffs this, saying that it's far too evolved and that it wasn't farmed. So yeah, the theory of Baby Yoda being a clone of Yoda, that's now out the window. We're also no closer to learning about the origins of the Yoda species, where they come from and so on. Since the events of the first episode though, Cool discovered IG-11 and reprogrammed it in order to serve him. This is a nice little comment on his slavery, and it's a nice little role reversal for the character. We did know that IG-11 would be back eventually, but for me this was a great surprise to see him pop up for this. Watching it learn to walk, it really makes you become attached to the character, and I'm glad that he's a good guy now, as I was massively looking forward to seeing Taika Waititi back in the role. It's no longer a hunter, but now a protector, and it kind of shows that droids take on a personality that is governed by the things around them. So yeah, bad people make bad droids, which is a nice little bit of trivia for the Star Wars universe, and it kind of adds a lot of weight as to why so many people, including Mando, distrust the machines. Maybe, maybe we should just start being nice to them. 
On the ship, Mando and Kara arm wrestle, and Baby Yoda mistakenly believes that she's hurting him, and it begins to force choke her. Not only does it show that Baby Yoda is gaining a stronger control of the Force, due to the fact that it doesn't strain him, but also it hints that the character could be leaning more towards the dark side. Force choking was a tactic used by Darth Vader, and the idea of raising things the right way, which we saw in IG-11, is also reflected here with the subtext being that perhaps all of the things Mano has gone through have had a negative effect on the character. Cool also mentions that the Force was something that he'd heard rumours about, which exemplifies just how little is known about it since the fall of the Jedi. It used to be massively prevalent in the Star Wars universe, but now it's all over and it only exists in folklore and legend. Mando and crew arrive on Navarro and Grief is waiting for them with three bounty hunters. There's sort of a Mexican standoff almost with no one really trusting anyone and everything is uneasy. Also, when Baby Yoda appears, I, I kinda got flashes of Lord of the Rings when Boromir would obsess over Middle Earth's most prized possession. Baby Yoda, yeah, is just a lot cuter though. By campfire, Grief discusses the plan and there's a nod to the Empire basically just being made up of mercenaries that will run for the hills once they lose their paycheck. The conversation is cut short though when Grief is attacked by members of the local wildlife that looks slightly like Arcanian dragons from Star Wars lore. It kind of reminded me a bit of Pitch Black and I loved seeing the creatures terrorise the camp with laser blasts and flamethrowers lighting up the night sky. Grief is badly poisoned by one of the creatures but luckily Baby Yoda is on deck to force heal him. This ability was hinted at in the first episode, and apparently the idea of force healing is going to be a big plot aesthetic in The Rise of Skywalker, with several characters being able to carry out the process. I think Disney deliberately introduced it here so that when it showed up in the film it wasn't completely unfounded, but it makes for a brilliant moment that adds a lot of weight to why Baby Yoda must be protected at all costs. We stand for you Baby Yoda. In the next scene, Grief kills the three bounty hunters that he was with, revealing that this was initially supposed to be a double cross. He's just committed a triple cross though, and he reveals that the plan was originally to hand the kid over and win back good favour with the client but they decide to still go ahead with everything in order to stop the wave of hunters coming after them. So the plan is back on and Cool takes Baby Yoda back to the ship using the crib as a decoy. Similar to A New Hope, they use the fake prisoner thing that they did with Chewbacca and head towards the location. Entering the city, they pass scout troopers and speeder bikes, which come into the ending of the episode. To their surprise, there's a lot more stormtroopers, and this subtly shows that the First Order, or rather Empire at this point, is starting to build their forces up. Upon arriving at the meeting place, the client remarks upon the Mando's Beskar steel, and we kinda get some lip service pay to the fact that the Mandalorian purge, in which the Empire tried to take over their home planet, is why their numbers are so low. It also adds a lot of weight to the theory from last time, that the New Republic is basically just failing at controlling the galaxy due to their over-reliance on droids, and this is why the galaxy destabilised to the point that the Empire was able to resume control once more. The client demands that the baby is shown, but an incoming call comes in from none other than Moff Gideon, played by Giancarlo Esposito. Personally, I believe that this was the one who approached Fennec at the end of the Tatooine episode, and he shows he's actually behind it all, pulling all of the strings. A shootout ensues with there being far more blaster bolts than are capable from coming from Mando's side, and it turns out that Gideon has stormed the group with not only stormtroopers, but purge troopers too. Mando stupidly breaks radio silence with Cool, and this alerts scout troopers who swarm towards the location. Cool is killed off camera before speeders arrive, which ends the episode. Now, there's two ways to look at what really happened here, which I'll get into now before we talk about Moff Gideon. I have seen some people assume that Cool was killed by IG-11, and like Mando said, killers are always killers. However, there's no reason why the character wouldn't have done this on the ship, or at least tried to, and if you look at the concept art for the credits, there's speeders chasing and firing at Cool, so maybe one of them just got lucky. We also see Gideon arrive in a TIE fighter that has the ability to fold its wings, and this is actually a new model that we haven't seen before. The episode ends with Gideon having them at a stalemate, and it looks like the Empire finally got what it wanted. Going forward though, I think next week will just be an all-out war between Mano's forces and the Empire. 
Whilst they are massively outnumbered, Baby Yoda is getting brought to the location and, as we know, he's becoming much more versed in the Force, being able to use it without straining himself and even developing offensive abilities such as Force Choking. I actually think that Mando may be killed or at the very least heavily damaged due to the final battle and thus Baby Yoda will have to pull all its energy to heal him. We also last saw the Mandalorians on Navarro and I think that they may be hidden out on the planet somewhere. After what the Klein said they'll definitely have beef with the Empire so seeing them all gathered in one place it could be like Christmas for the group. I think IG-11 will get involved in the fight as well as he's just seen his master get gunned down and no doubt he'll want to help Mando and Baby Yoda out. It's definitely going to go down next week and with them killing Cool off, who knows if anyone will make it out alive. Grief's, grief's dead though isn't he? Yeah, grief, Grief's probably dead. Now obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts on The Mandalorian Episode 7 as well as what your theories for the future are. Make sure you leave them in the comments section below and if you enjoyed this video then force push that like button and if you want to see more Star Wars stuff then make sure you check out our full breakdown of the entire plot for The Rise of Skywalker which will be linked at the end. This episode was moved up because of the release of the movie and it looks like Disney are really going all in on it. We go over the leaks that have been confirmed so it's definitely worth checking out if you want to know more. If you want to come chat to me after the video then make sure you follow me on Twitter at DefinitionYT or head over to my Discord server which will be linked in the description below. We drop videos on there early so if you want to see stuff before anyone else then that's the best place to be. It's free to join and we have an awesome community so hopefully I'll see you over there very soon. We're also giving away a free copy of Joker which is one of our favourite movies of the year and all you have to do to be in with a chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe to the channel and leave your thoughts on The Mandalorian in the comment section below. The winner is going to be chosen at random on the 15th of January in a that will be shipped out from then to gets the prize, so best of luck to everyone who takes part. This is a channel for people who are never missing television, so if that's the kind of thing you like, you need to subscribe to Definition. Thanks again for taking the time to watch this, you've been the best and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.